get the speaker notes up. All right. Hi. Uh, yeah, like Liam said, my name's Jordan. Um, I come to you from Colorado in the U.S. Uh, my daytime job, I work in FinTech, um, but I don't use uh, WebAssembly there. Uh, we, all of my um, experience has really come from curiosity. Uh, we're going in, in yeah, there's the big disclaimer. I've never done this before. So uh, prepare to laugh at me. It's cool. Um, however, I did do that for a decade, so I'm pretty confident in myself. So if you need tips on parking a 35,000-ton ship, I can do that. This is much more intimidating, though. So uh, I appreciate you all and bear with me. Uh, the story I'm going to share with you all today is really a story about how accepting this community has been, how it's been to learn WebAssembly, not from a day-to-day -day job, but really going in the docs, reading the code, and then hopefully building an application with it. That actually works. Uh, here's my real resume. Uh, I'm going to circle two. A lot of my frustration, and I, I decided to share this with you all because a lot of my frustration actually started when I was more in the cybersecurity uh, field. A lot, of the, a lot of the work we did was you pull data out of the sim, you analyze the data, you try and find the outliers, you shingle it, you try and do all this stuff. But after doing it for almost five, six years, I found out that me and my tier one, tier two analysts, we had scripts that we ran. We emailed or slacked each other those scripts. I might change something, they might change something. Ultimately, the scripts diverged and Sometimes they got stuck in um, source code management, sometimes they didn't. And it, it got extremely hard to, to know like what the real truth was. And that's kind of where it comes in, what to trust. Uh, and how I find myself here, the next job I got was in the Kubernetes space, which eventually landed me as a Go developer, which I do today, and I love a lot. So. Some of the challenges that I've met trying to introduce this new technology, and we've all been there, um, alpha beta libraries, you know, things at that level, they break. It's okay, that's what we expect. However, it's really hard to get buy-in from leadership when I said, hey, this is worth my time, pay my salary, I promise you we'll get something on this, it's gonna break. And like, well, we're not there yet. Um, and that's kind of, and then those are a lot of things I've run into. Documentation. The one of the hardest things I've been is this. This ecosystem is primarily in Rust. I don't speak Rust. I don't understand Rust. It's very much over my head. I do Go, but I spend a lot of my time reading Rust code and trying to port it over. And the real way I've learned is I've taken a lot of Rust code, ported it to Go. We'll never go anywhere, pun not intended. Uh, but that's how I learn. But then I have my coworkers I also have to motivate. If I want to get leadership on board, maybe I need like a cadre of coworkers behind me. How do I motivate them? Like, team, there's this thing. It's coming. It'll, board. It'll be awesome. But I can't really convince a lot of them to spend their free time learning it because, you know, family, everyone has their reasons. But like family, other obligations, it's hard to get that buy-in. I have them. All right. So what will we be talking about today? We're going to be talking about all these things in the terms of like what they mean to me. What, do they, what does zero trust mean? What is secure software to me? Uh, how does WebAssembly help? And then we're going to get into Wasm Cloud, which is really how I cut my teeth on WebAssembly, how I learned it, so I use it. And quite frankly, the experience has been really great with some you know, bumps along the way, but they have a team behind them that helps bar none, hands down, any time of day, and they've been pretty amazing. They're all sitting over here if y'all want to meet them. Um, and then we're going to wrap in tail scale and wire guard for fun. Really, you'll see my stack here in a minute and you'll understand why. And then can we do this with a real world application? And spoiler alert, we can. Um, so again, what is secure software? This is secure software to me as it relates to the application I'm going to show you here in a minute. 
So a lot of people have talked about sandboxing today. One of my favorite things about WebAssembly is you put code in the sandbox. If it's not allowed outside the sandbox, it doesn't go outside the sandbox. And that's really powerful. And we'll see a short demo of that in a minute. Uh, then can we distribute it? My first few, oh God, years in Kubernetes, just trying to understand all the intricate parts of that, because I came in in like 2018 Kubernetes, I wasn't early. All the pieces, all the moving parts, it was mind blowing. Being an early, being early to WebAssembly and early to these frameworks has really allowed me the time to go slow and understand where they're coming, you know, what they're doing, and specifically distributed framework in Wasm Cloud, I've had a lot of chance, uh, opportunity to really take the time to understand it. Uh, that's not really secure software because I wrote it, but I wanted to put a dog on there. All right, so then for my requirement, a piece of secure software needs to be, needs to have access, authentication, and authorization. We're gonna really lean on NATS and Telscale for that. And then obviously at the high level, we're gonna wrap it with TLS. But what you're gonna, what you're gonna witness in this is what I'm gonna write is about 20 lines, you know, 20 lines of code plus a front end. Uh, the front end doesn't count. But it's, it's not much, because I'm really gonna lean on these pioneers in the space to, to uh, empower me. All right, so these are the textbook definitions of zero trust and what it means. Um, I read them all, I distilled it to what I could, and I was sitting in our, the Wasm Cloud Slack channel one day when one of my coworkers, Z, said this, and I finally realized, yeah, that's what I agree with. And zero trust is not about mistrust, it's actually about segmenting trust. And that really opened my eyes and provided me with like, I see a pathway, I, I now see how WebAssembly, Wasm Cloud, and these other pieces will really tie this together. It's not that I don't trust any one of them or don't trust this. It's that security is an onion. You have to wrap the onion as many layers as you can. And segmenting trust is a way to wrap that onion. All right. So this is straight from WebAssembly's website. So I don't need to read, uh, read it to you. But the feature I'm really going to lean on in this demonstration is the sandboxing. Um, we're going to look at this piece of code. So this piece of code has two parts. Um, my boss said, you need to write the best Hello World app in the world, and I did. I wrapped it in pink. And then someone came along the way and decided, I'm going to hijack your code. You're not going to see it because you're working so hard, it slipped through the you know, code review, and we're gonna, we're gonna hijack your application. So over here, we have the, the exact same code segment running, uh, and I don't know why the GIFs are so slow, I apologize. But we're gonna run it straight, and then we're gonna compile it to WASI and run it with WASM time. And you very much see that over there, not only did the XFIL server, which is this bottom half of the screen, get the data, you know, we can also see at the top uh, that, you know, the, the request was successful. Over here, I'm actually not printing the error. We still get our business logic of hello world, but if I were to print that error, what you would see is, you're, you know, you do not have access to, or you do not have authorization to do that, or, uh, you know, pre pre perform this. I, uh, I should have printed it up there. You can't do that, um, which is really powerful because essentially at this point, we're running a segment of code that was hijacked, but it's stuck in the sandbox and can't get out. So moving on to the next Lego block of Wasm Club. Now I need to distribute my app. I want it portable. Polyglot, polyglot's something we'll see in a minute. Kelsey brought it up earlier. If everyone, if we need 50 Postgres drivers how annoying would that be, and how, how likely are we to bring in, you know, you know, attract all these people? We're actually gonna see that in Wasm Cloud, it's written once, it's gonna be Redis, not uh, Postgres, but it's written once, it's written in Rust, it works, I don't have to use it, I'm gonna do everything else and go, 
and we're just going to interact via the RPC with this, uh, you know, Redist uh, driver. That's an entire actor. So that is what business logic looks like. Uh, it takes in an HTTP request. It does not care from what. I can have an HTTP server written in Go. I can have it written in Zig. I can have it written in Rust. It doesn't care. It takes the request. It performs your business logic. And then it puts it back on the RPC. That's really powerful to me. I no longer have to worry about these um, you know, segments of code that I've spent hours of my life writing, like how many times have I imported the HTTP server in Go? How many times have I turned the knobs on that? How many times have I brought in different you know, database drivers? And it equates to hundreds of lines of code that don't really matter to me. When, ironically enough, I'm writing one H, uh, you know, API endpoint that has like seven, code, seven lines of code, and the whole project has 300 lines of code. It's just maddening. So while well, Wasm Cloud does all these pieces, we're going to really focus in on, on those four. So sign module. So one of the awesome things I love about this platform is once you compile your WebAssembly module down, right, tiny go, Rust, whatever you want to do, go soon, um, you have this WebAssembly module you can run in Wasm time. You cannot take that way same WebAssembly module and run it in Wasm Cloud. And the reason being, it only invokes signed modules. So right out of the box, I know that without proper access to a key set, this module that I'm running can't actually run. And what you're going to see is actually two keys. An account key that says, hey, this person or this organization, they signed this. So if you were to look at for example, the Wasm Cloud repo, they have a whole you know, list of supported actors, supported providers, and you can guarantee that that team wrote that and provided and published them because that key is also published and you can compare them. And then we have a module key, which says this module in a succession, so version one, version two, version three, is the same module. So they can't, for example, take this echo actor and just slip a new ver you know a new you know new business like same echo actor but it does it in a different way now if you don't want to do that we check the module key it's always that lineage of model and then not only do we get this the power of the sandbox from wasm time or you know the wasm runtime we also get with a second layer of, of capability um, control security in Wasm Cloud, because what they're going to say is when you're signing it, you sign it with the contract that it's allowed to do. So, for example, here, this actor can take requests, and that's it. It cannot use that same connection to, you know, request, you know, instigate a request from itself. So it can't reach out to the internet for, you know, on its own. It can only do a single uh, receive request. So and now we're going to see it in action. What you have is, can you see my mouse? Yeah. These are the exact same actor, but you'll note that this side has this HTTP server piece here. Um, that's me telling the the platform that, hey, this, this actor, it's allowed to talk over the RPC bus and receive HTTP calls. Over here, you'll see a 500 um, error. On the exact same set of code, the only difference is when we signed it, signed it with the same keys, signed it with the same uh, actor and, and module key, but we forgot to give it a capability. And if we were, I think I actually have it, there you go. If we were to actually look at the error, you can see invocation fails simply because we haven't signed it with the right claim. Again, adding to that layer, you know, that layer of security, that's pretty powerful. Then we get to another layer of security policies. This is also very powerful because policies are nothing more than a Wasm Cloud actor itself. It's still signed. It still has the same invocations, but 
we can say, if we look at my, the example here, we're going to say, in our cluster, only official Wasm Cloud, as dictated by their public key, is allowed to run here. So again, over here, we have the exact same actor running twice. On the bottom, I freshly compiled it, and on the top, I'm using the one out of the OCI registry. Same code, same everything. We get denied by policy. Again, very powerful because we're not learning a new technology. We're not bringing in like OPA or anything. I'm, I'm staying within actor, small, understandable units of code. And then lastly, the last uh, security feature I'm going to talk about are invocations. So when one actor talks to a provider, a provider to an actor, um, they speak over an RPC bus like this. For example, what I've done is we have the echo. I invoke the echo and these three messages, whatever, go over the RPC. The request, the response, and number two is the runtime saying, hey, we logged this. Your invocation was successful because, you know, we checked to ensure that the signatures were correct. We checked to make sure that, the, you know, the hashes inside the claims are correct. Everything's happy. And if we actually blew up the jot that's inside of that invocation, you know, we get, we get this. And this is a Go representation of the Rust code that does the verification, but you can see we take the origin, we take the target, we take the operation, which in this example is handle a, uh, HTTP server handle request. We hash it, we hex it, and then we stick it back in there, and then when it gets to the other side, not only does it check to make sure that it's coming from a valid source, it actually checks to make sure that the payload has not been uh, edited along the way. So our onions just getting more and more layers of security. And now we're at the point with, can we do something real with this? Um, and this is kind of where the demo is not that impressive, but it almost took me six, seven months to figure it all out because it's all new. I, you know, you learn how actors are invoked. You, under, you under, try to understand how WebAssembly modules run in the runtime. Uh, and then, oh yeah, there's Jim. Uh, and a quick note on Telesco, if you don't know what it is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an open source VPN built on WireGuard. Um, essentially, they have a really robust feature set. One of them is this TSNet. What TSNet lets us do is it actually allows us to um, create a Telnet node, so a machine, out of an H a Go HTTP server. So what we're actually going to see is I'm going to take a Wasm Cloud HD server provider, which has been upgraded to uh, a Telscale node, and we're actually going to run our application on our Telnet in Wasm Cloud with no external, well, one external, Redis, but no external resources. That's not important. All right, so ultimately, if you've never seen the Wasm Cloud dashboard, this is what we're going to end up looking like. We're going to start an API gateway. We're going to start two providers, one for Redis, one for tail, uh, tail scale or so an HTTP server. And from Joe's talk earlier, you'll notice these contracts in the middle. These are not WASI contracts because WASI is so new, and the, the team will happily tell you that WASI is coming to, uh, to, to Wasm Cloud soon. Um, but for now, they are extremely similar in their capabilities. They're contracts that, that decide what capabilities these providers can do, and then the actors at the same time will be signed with those capabilities. Oh, and one thing I like to point out because I find it very interesting. So this is a view application, actually. There we go. That was a view application. The view application is actually compiled, built, and then compiled into a Rust, act, Rust Wasm actor. So within our WebAssembly module, we're actually hosting an entire view application, which kind of blew my mind the first time I saw it. Um, 
So when you see this, there's no, there's no like separate HTTP server serving web pages somewhere. We're going to hit our provider. Provider is going to route all the traffic to the gateway. The gateway has two endpoints for off in and off Z. If it doesn't want either of those endpoints, it's going to forward it to another WebAssembly uh, uh, module that will then in turn serve web pages. I think that's kind of fascinating. OK, here this goes. All right. I am cheating. I will be copying and pasting these commands. I'm not brave enough to do it live. find them. Cool. All right. So no tricks up my sleeve. I'm actually going to start Wasm Cloud right in front of you. There is nothing running already. Live demo. All right. Accept that. There we go. All right, so at this point I have the host running. If we were to look at the dashboard, you'd see an empty dashboard. We're going to start our two actors. So our UI and our API gateway, both WebAssembly modules. And if you're interested in ever playing with this, these all of these artifacts have been added to GitHub Container Registry. For All right, and then we're going to start two providers. So this will be the way we ingress via HTTP and access our Redis server. That is an actor. That was the wrong section. There we go. And the last thing we're going to do is actors and providers, they talk over an RPC bus. But it's not automatic. We can start these. They're running. They're sitting there idle. What we're actually going to do is provide a link to the, uh, to the bus that says this actor and this provider are allowed to communicate. Boom. All right. So now we're going to. How do I minimize this? All right. So this is what it looks like, just like the, the picture from earlier. We have two actors, we have two providers, and they're linked together. And if we go. This is the nerve wracking part. Oh, oh, very cool. So now what I'm showing you is from my laptop, we're accessing my telnet, which is the Minotaur Hammerhead uh, UI via Wasm Cloud. Which is so cool because these web pages are in a, in a, in a web facility module. I'm accessing it over. Uh, tail scale. I don't know. This kind of blew my mind when I did it. So that's part one. But just hosting our application, you know, isn't enough. We need to be able to turn the knobs of things like reliability, sustainability, and scalability. And I've got to find. <laughs> Minimize. Sorry. Oh well. Which is the next thing we're going to actually show. So at this point, we have an application that's running 
on my local machine um, that only I can access because I'm the only one with access to my telnet. But if we use a tool like Cosmonic, which is a platform for Wasm Cloud, this is the same exact application running, um, but the powerful thing is it's running on three different hosts and I think two different clouds. So we have a gateway that's running in AWS, we have a to-do app running in GCP, we have a tail scale also running in AWS, and what's really cool is this Redis provider is still running on my laptop. So, oh. can't see the button. There we go. So what's mind-blowing about this is if you can see the URL, to do at Minotaur, Hammerhead, TS.net, all of you have access to this right now. It is live, it's on the internet. By way of Telscale's funnel capability, it's being hosted from a Redis server on my laptop, a UI in one cloud, a gateway in another cloud, and it's all tying it together with the power of this RPC bus called, you know, the Wasm Cloud's Lattice. And a few things that I want to point out on this page, because they might go overlooked, is you'll notice that I'm authenticated. I'm authenticated because by way of traversing that Telnet, um, Telscale knows who I am. So within my gateway, my gateway says, if Jordan from this Telnet access, then he's clear to use the application. And then the little green dot that can be completely um, ignored is another piece of the gateway actor providing authorization. <clears throat> so that's actually providing a JWT by way of authentication of Tailscale that gives me the power to actually interact with this app. So you can note, I can sit here and, and do all the things. Now, what's cool is Tailscale offers things like, well, I need my, I need my shell back. There we go. Um, Tailscale offers ACL list that says, you don't even have to be in my telnet. If I share this piece, this node with you, you can access it. So I actually have a, let's see. I have a second Tailscale account that I'm going to switch over to, and if everything goes right, I'm not a front-end developer, so sometimes you have to hit refresh. Ha. Huh. You'll see, not only did I just switch authentication, I got a new picture, if you hover over it, I've got a new user, but this user, even though he's authenticated to the ACAD, to the application, is not authorized, so that green dot will never turn green. And you'll note that means I can never actually interact with this app, but I can access it in whatever logic I want to. So now we have, in my opinion, a secure distributed application that by power of you know, Wasm Cloud and Cosmonic should have no downtime. And this is a real world application. I could let people sign up and interact with it. And I have no overhead of users. You all, you know, you, you access it, you know, if you're connected to your telnet, you have access to the, to the application. Um, all right. And then the last thing I want to say is, with zero trust, I found that doesn't actually exist. You've got to trust something, right? We trust in keys, for, which is given to us by the folks over at Synadia by way of NATS. It's uh, an ED25519 way for 
doing things like uh, signing and, and that, that type of stuff. Um, Tailscale gives us access control list. We trust them, they're the experts. I don't need to roll custom roll access control list. Wasm Time gives us module sandboxing, and then Wasm Cloud gives us distributed, you know, way to ensure my invocations are from who I want them to, and policies so I can lock it down if I feel like it. And after a year of not knowing what WebAssembly was to, to now, this has been a really amazing journey where actually most of you in this room has probably helped me at one point. If you get slacked by either Captain America or the Hulk, it's me. Um, but yeah, amazing community. The potential here is endless, and I really see how we can build some amazingly secure and fun things with it. And that's all I really have. Thank you. Jordan, thank you very much. Um, questions for Jordan? Hi, I'm Christoph. Thank you for the talk. Um, I really think that the world needs another to-do application, so I will post your link on Hacker News, and uh, all of a sudden millions of people will uh, use your application. Um, to phrase the question differently, what about like performance application of like this distributed application? Yeah, so I will say I'm a happy hacker, but what I have found is in my testing, I have actually run this exact application on Raspberry Pis and then giving it access to the entire Wasm Cloud Slack channel with a like few hundred people. And I really, and at my home, over a 5G connection. And I really haven't seen any latency or problems with it. And no one's complained. So I don't have any formal statistics or metrics on it, but my experience has been, even on like the worst possible network and device I've given it, it's, it's held its own, so, yeah. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, in hindsight, what would you like to have known one year ago when you started your journey with WebAssembly? Um, that I need to understand Rust. Uh, no. Um, a year ago, uh, I think the, the one thing I want to know is I never really jumped into a project where it's on me to run down solutions, right? We have an amazing team, amazing people in this community, but if you really want to understand like what Wasm Time's doing, how WIT works, you know, we have documentations, it's not always complete. You have to go look at the code and kind of grok it yourself. Um, I've spent many, many hours trying to understand code segments, and if I couldn't, then porting it to a language I did understand only because that's how my mind learned it. And now that would get thrown away because you don't, you don't want my code in production. Other questions? Jordan, I think you kind of undersold some of the neatest things of your demo, um, the Go and Rust code working together. Okay. We're going to have more of that later today in the uh, component talk with uh, Peter Hewen and uh, Guy Bedford uh, from Fastly. I really appreciate you coming out today. Thank you so much for sharing your time yeah, with us. Thank you for having me.